Hey. Hey. Still here. Wow. Calling Chris Anderson. Uh, this is Chris Anderson calling Rick Pryor. I'm I'm here in uh, Chicago. Uh, awesome. Yeah, clearly, yeah. Santa, Santa didn't bring us new clothes. So. I I uh, Santa did not bring any new clothes. <laughs> uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. It will turn into 2024 next year. And it should be a very interesting year in so many ways. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour, the last History Happy Hour of 2023, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, offering a wide variety of history tours in Europe. The Pacific. The, the Pacific and the U.S. Yeah. Check it out at stephenambrosetours.com. And whether you're watching live, watching on replay, or listening on the HHH podcast, thank you for joining us today. We're going to be delving into ancient Greek history yeah. and battles that save democracy and anyway if you've started important. drinking early for new year's eve let us know what you've got and the greeks are known for drinking eggnog before going into battle first. yeah so maybe you should have some eggnog that would uh, make a lot of sense well, um uh, champagne though no we've moved on from christmas so not champagne something stronger if you want and chris we should thank everybody who uh, supports us on patreon especially oh, our cool. top shelf patrons Absolutely. And you can join this group by clicking on patreon.com slash history happy hour. Nice even look now. I know, I saw that, yeah. To the graphics. So. so we can start a whole new column. We can start a new column, the next person who signs uh, up. So if you want to see what that new column looks like, you want to stand out from all the others, become a top shelf patron. That's right. Okay. Well, um, I you know, tell us okay. what you're drinking. Tell us where you are. Tell us that you're watching. We're, we'll, well, we're honestly, we're not. That's what books you got for Christmas? It's an encore episode, but we can, you know, we can read. We can see the oh, stuff. Oh. And uh, and why don't you get us underway? bar is open the bar is open it has been 2500 years since uh the athens the birthplace of democracy joined with the other greek states to fight off the mighty persian empire uh and so the question that might not come to your mind right away but does come to ours is how does this affect the world we live in today and to explore that we are joined by stephen kershaw who's the author of the new book the Epic Battles That Saved Democracy. Uh, and those three battles are Marathon, Thermopylae, and Salamis. Uh, here's the book, by the way. Uh, uh, two. Rick, Rick, yeah. don't put your fingers over the title. Oh, right. oh, there, you. You yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay, there's a book. Right. Much better. It's two victories and one very famous Spartan defeat. Uh, and Steve has been a classics tutor for 30 years. He's also created Oxford University's online course on Greek mythology, the fall of Rome, and the Minoans and Mycenaeans. He lectures at the Victoria and Albert Museum and runs the European Studies classical tour for Rhodes College and the University of the South. Steve Kershaw, welcome, you Thank antiquity you scholar, much. to History Happy Hour. Yeah, well, hey. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be with you. Okay, oh, and you brought good. a cocktail. So, what are yes. you drinking? Uh, I'm I'm on the Negronis tonight. Oh. Oh. So, do you have a cocktail, Mr. Anderson? I, I have a I have something that's fortified and looks an awful lot like water, but might not be. <laughs> <laughs> but might be. <laughs> <laughs> and I am, as always, uh, almost always drinking a a nice beer here. Um, so, so Steve. Uh, just a throw you a big softball at the beginning. What drew you to write about this time period, and what, in brief, is kind of the the thrust of your book? I mean, I think we get it's three battles that saved democracy, but give us a give us a little bit about what what brought you to this and and what you're trying to say. Yeah, I, I guess I mean I've, I've been interested in this for in the classical world, the world of the ancient Greeks, for so long now since I was ten year old boy, when I had uh, uh, I was introduced to it really by. At my primary school by somebody who came into the school and, and read to us from the Iliad and the Odyssey 
and for me that was just the best thing ever i thought this was fantastic and uh, and this just inspired me you know I, I must have gone home enthused about it to my my parents uh, my grandpa bought me a copy of the iliad in uh, and i read it with my torch under the bedclothes and uh, and that kind of sent me off on my on my journeys into the classical world really so uh, th that took me to you know studying latin greek that kind of thing at school on to degrees at university and then uh, into a into a career in in teaching writing traveling in the ancient world and uh, uh, and, and and very much living that living that thing really that that whole historical um, uh, presence which I've I've enjoyed very much and the I, I think the idea for the three epic battles book was mainly you said at the beginning 2500 years since those battles and 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 it was essentially written to to come out to coincide with those final victories in a sense they those things were being amongst other things commemorated in greece very strongly and uh, so it seemed in, in a way an appropriate moment to to write about something that's no, no, i mean not just 2500 years old but in a sense is is a timeless piece of history that has resonances that come right through to the modern world i think so so steve uh, you know you just said this uh and it's something we refer to we refer to these battles as this clash between uh greece and and persia um but in the book you point out that uh, events between the 12th and 8th centuries are difficult to trace, but what emerges towards the end of that era is a people who are divided into a large number of independent communities, which they call polis. There was no such thing as Greece in the sense of a 21st century nation state. So can you explain uh, a bit as we're setting out as kind of a baseline? What are we talking about? What is what is Greece and what are these city states? And, and kind of Yeah, but very much so. I think, and this is a really important aspect of all of this is that is that sometimes this this conflict is presented as a, a sort of monolithic clash between Greece and Persia or between even you know, the East and the West. But in fact, the, the Greek world as it exists when the, the Persians invade it is, is, is a very disunited world in a sense. So it's the, the it's, which is partly governed by the geography of Greece. Greece is a very mountainous country and which means that the the communities that inhabit it are living very often in, in quite isolated communities they have a great feeling of independence and their allegiance really is is local so the people that we think of as greeks have lots in common they all speak greek they all worship the same gods they all read homer they they have a, an overarching cultural unity if you like but their lives are lived in small independent ferociously independent communities so they they think of themselves not as greeks in essence but as athenians spartans corinthians thebans um, milesians whatever and there are literally hundreds of these of these greek states and in fact it's only really towards the end of the Persian invasion that the the Greeks start to conceive a sense of of unity they call they start to call themselves they never call themselves Greeks in the ancient world that's a Roman term for them but they they call themselves Hellenes and really the first time that they call themselves Hellenes is at towards the end of this conflict with the Persian so and prior to that they're thinking very much in in local terms so it would you know if if i were if you know if if england were greece then i would be thinking of myself as oxford rather than english if you like right. so could you i mean just following off from that would you say that this this conflict then creates the idea of greece in many is ways that, that... yes in many ways it, it does because they 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 need it's it's in this conflict Threat, even threatened from the outside, they they struggle desperately for sufficient unity to resist the invaders, and the, and they, they're operating on this kind of um, my enemy's enemy is my friend right. principle, and there are deep rivalries between these 
these Greek city states. I mean, if you think of it like the rival rivalry between sports teams or something like that. So the, um, you know, in, in English football, uh, you know, Manchester United hate Leeds United. Right. So, and, so, per, so Persia would be Manchester City then. Yeah, so Persia right. would be Manchester right. City. Okay, so, so just and <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and uh, yeah, so yeah, let's say City play United, um, and they they will hate each other, and um, and the people in Leeds who hate Manchester United will all cheer for Manchester City. Right. You know, it's a, and I'm sure you have American football. Let's move. Let's move out of the the, the soccer uh, references as quickly as possible. Um, so, okay, so the the bad guys in this story uh, are the Persians, and they're the bad guys in part because all the accounts we have of the story, especially Herodotus, but basically all of the accounts come from the Greek side. The Persians either didn't write it down or it didn't survive. Um, uh, and so who are the Persians uh, and what is the scope of their empire and why are the Persian leaders, uh, Darius, who's, who leads the, the, uh, who's the head of the Persian empire for the first invasion and then after he passes away his son Xerxes, why are they attacking Greece and are they really bad guys or is that just a little historical bias going on? <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's, we're always trying to untangle bias here. And, and as you rightly say, the, the vast amount of evidence that's coming to us, particularly written evidence, is from the Greek side, uh, not from the Persian side. Many good reasons, perhaps, for it not becoming from the Persian side. A, they didn't win. Uh, although, <laughs> although, although it, it, it could have been spun as a victory, I think, because the um, two of the initial... Uh, sort of war aims of the Persian Empire were achieved during the invasion. Um, it may not have been seen in Persia as being quite as important as it was in Greece. There's another aspect of it. You know, this is a um, you know a minor thing on the fringes of the empire. Maybe that's unlikely. But uh, but but yeah, but what we don't have is is accounts coming from the Persian side in any way, shape, or form in the same kind of detail as they come from the Greek. And the, I mean, the, you asked about the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire is enormous, so uh, it's 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 well established. And yes, as you've beautifully put on the screen there, it goes, it covers pretty much everything that's on that map, apart from the top right, top left hand corner of it, which so is Greece. Persian, yeah, yeah, which is the mainland Greece itself. So it covers everything from what is now the the coast of modern Turkey. Uh, in the in the west, right into India in the in the east, it it also includes Egypt and Arabia, so it's bordered by essentially deserts at the south. It's bordered by major river on the on the east and by and by seas at the uh, at the at the west. And one of the things that's happened is that it's in the course of its expansion, it's come to control cities that are culturally Greek, Greek cities which uh, are inhabiting the, the, this coast of, uh, uh, of Asia Minor, of, of, of say what is now Turkey, some, some, yeah, some very well established, culturally very advanced Greek cities that, are, that have come under Persian control. And it's, it's really that that is the, if you like, the flashpoint for the, the conflict. It is, it, we, we start to get conflicts be, between these Greek cities and the, their Persian overlords. And that, dra that then has involvement of, of cities within Greece itself. So that, that's essentially how the, the, conflict, the, the, the conflict comes in, in, in the large sense. That's how the conflict comes out. So, Steve, um, one of the things that, you know, obviously the, the things that you're kind of driving at in the book is that these these battles uh, save democracy. Um, but at the beginning, it's it's kind of it would be a stretch to call these Greek city states democratic. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit? I mean, first of all, I mean, I know you go into some length about how, how Athens becomes a de democracy. But but the, where does it where does this idea of democracy come from? If at the start, the Greeks aren't even. They don't even govern themselves that way. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Again, I think the, the the key democratic state is Athens, and and many of the other Greek states are not democratic. 
they haven't gone that way. Sparta isn't, for instance. But as as yes, in, 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 I, I do go and do it in the book a little bit, where we the the process of Athens becoming a democracy it takes a long time. It just doesn't happen overnight. It's an evolutionary process that that, that just involves the people themselves and or, or their and, and their leaders collectively acquiring more and more and more powers uh, within the state so it's uh, there and there are various stages important stages along the way they they the first time they get a written code of laws is important uh, they abolish internal slavery for instance they uh, so athenians are no longer kept as slaves at athens and, and ultimately, there's a, a character called Cleisthenes who comes onto the scene and pushes through a series of political reforms that are designed explicitly to give power to the people, which is what the Greeks call democracy. But democracy to them is very different to what it is from, from us. So the, it means the rule, the, the krasi is the kratia, the power of the demos, who are the people but the people, the demos, are adult, male, native, and free. Mm-hmm. So they're a, a significant minority, in fact, within the state. So it's it's so people without political power are children, women, foreigners, slaves, in Athens. Mm-hmm. Um, and and Athens is unusual within the Greek world. Most of the other states are, in fact, ruled by aristocrats or sometimes by what's known as tyrants who are not necessarily tyrannical it's just the word the greeks use but they are sole rulers of their states who've usually taken power um, by force in some kind of way so athens is unusual but uh the if you like they have developed this democratic system which is remarkable and unique in a sense and and, and doesn't and, and it only happens um I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong, which I often am. But it only happens a, a few years before this, this, the before the the Persian invasion. And by a few, I mean like less than ten years. I mean, this yeah, is a it's, fresh yeah. new new thing that they're yeah, trying. Yeah, so, so yeah, you, you're absolutely right. The, the, this new system is is only kind of like a generation old when they come in. So it was, um, yeah, it's, it's yeah, roughly eighteen years probably between between the okay. the official. You know, uh, Athens in 508 thereabouts, 507 BC, uh, when when this system is set up, and then um, fi- 590, the Persians are in uh, 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 fighting the Athenians at Marathon, and and that is at stake, I think, because if if, if the Athenians lose that battle, Marathon, then their government system will be changed. They they have. The Persians traveling with them have an Athenian ex-tyrant who's been expelled about the same time as they were creating their democracy. And if the Persians win, then he comes back to Athens and Athens stops being a democracy, I think. So there's, you know, the, uh, you know all right, so democracy, it's a kind of democracy, the genie is out of the bottle. Somebody else might <laughs> install it somewhere else. But as far as the Athenians are concerned, they're this new system that they've got is hanging by a thread when so it's person. like a, it's like a little it's like a, <coughs> a, a a plant it's like a, a young plant coming out of the the earth and yeah. uh and and this is where it might get ripped up and then we might never see another one yeah that's yeah that's well put all right I, i'm done yeah. I'm here. <laughs> that's it for me <laughs> but so, you, but you say too that, or you you kind of allude to the fact that that this is sort of one of the things, the great strengths of of the Greeks or the Athenians in particular. You know, you have, you have Herodotus is saying uh, the Athenians went from strength to strength. It's obvious that freedom of speech is an excellent thing. Here is the proof: when they were under tyrannical rule, they were no better in the military sphere than any of their neighbors. But once they had freed themselves from tyrants, they became far and away the best. So uh, is, is democ- I mean, first of all, is democracy sort of the secret to their success? And, and are these Athenians aware that this is something special? Does it do they say, hey, this is really? I, th- I think I, th- I think they are. I think they're because um, you know Herodotus is getting his information <laughs> from there. <laughs> so right. you know he's talking to Athenians and he's looking at it from the outside. 
so I, I I think so, and I think this this new system where everybody has a stake in it. This is this is the important part of it. I think is that everybody is is involved. It's everybody has skin in the game. If if nobody participates and it's super participatory, and if nobody participates, it will fall apart. So everybody has to do their bit. They have to, you know, they have to serve in their in their government bodies. They have to they have to go. They have to vote. They have to go to the law courts. They have to run this system, and it's completely hands on. You know, it's it's done in person. It's done face to face, and it's also, I think, interestingly done. At, at, at sort of macro and micro level as well. So just like Greece is is a number of independent city states, of so polices, polis, then Athens is is the state of Athens and individual little things that are called deems, which are like little villages, and and they operate very closely. Everybody knows everybody else. They all have their own little constitutions that are like the big Athenian one. So everybody is, if you like, playing the democratic game all the time so they they have a huge vested interest in it and i think it's it's notable that herodotus says that that in as far as he's concerned i think that democracy is their key you know he, what he can look to is is a state that was unremarkable until it became democratic and then and then it becomes democratic and it becomes remarkable and he kind of makes that equation that might not be logical but that's how he sees it mm. So the, the first of the three battles that are in the title of your book, yeah. so probably worth focusing on, um, yeah. uh, is the Battle of Marathon in, I think it's 480 BC. Uh, yeah, 490. 490, 490, 490, 490. BC. And uh, a huge Persian army has, has landed there. They, um, they are very famously 26 miles from Athens. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, the Athenians have to decide whether to risk battle or not. So give us a sense of, 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 of this moment. What are the size of the forces? What what happens here? We do have a, a, a map. What happens here that, that makes this uh, it makes this something to remember? Yeah, so I mean the the, 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 the Persians come and this this map is as you say is located almost exactly 26 miles away from from Athens and, and the Persians have arrived with a with a fleet and a huge army it's to, to be honest to try to put numbers on these things is is very difficult but it's uh, it's an army that's in probably the tens of thousands uh and they're they're coming in on conventionally 600 ships uh and they which is they which are, is always the number right apparently. it's always the number yes it's, 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 persians well, always have 600 ships <laughs> they always do or multiples thereof yeah so yeah absolutely so so that they i mean the athenians know that they're coming and the, the Persians choose to land here because this is very much the territory of this guy Hippias, who they're probably going to install in uh, um, uh, in Athens. He's got his own sort of partisans there, and and if they they so the Persians land here, thinking this is a really good place to fight because it's it's a flat area of land, and uh, their prime military assets are their cavalry and their archers really they don't really want to fight face to face unless they have to in fact they don't want to fight at all unless they have to one of the reasons they bring so huge numbers of of troops really is just to menace people into submission they'd much rather not fight at all but so so they encamp at marathon the athenians then have a decision to make do we go and confront the persians at marathon and the persians think well that's cool because we'll win if you do um, or do we stay in Athens and perhaps uh, decide to resist a siege or an, an assault that way? The Persians, I think, are thinking, well, that's cool if you do that as well, because we've got friends of Hippias and so on. They're likely to open the gates of the city and we'll win that way as well. So for the Persians, they think it's win-win. The Athenians then have this decision to make. Do we stay in the city or do we come out and fight? And it's credited to a guy called Miltiades, Miltiades or Miltiades, if you prefer, uh, who persuades them to go to Marathon to confront the Persians there. And Marathon has it, has, it has its plus points for the Persians very definitely, but it has its plus points for the Greeks as well, because the, the plain is relatively narrow and it's surrounded by mountains on pretty much all sides. And uh, you're now looking at the, at the 
uh, the mountain on which the Greek forces probably deployed uh, initially. So the Greeks are sitting on that mountain, looking out. The Persians are out on the left, and uh, uh, and the sea. You can just see the sea beyond. It's very, it's very close. It's like half a mile away, and uh, so the Greeks can station themselves there, looking at the Persian forces, uh, blocking the ways to Athens, which you've got to go through mountain passes, which are narrow. So they're here and they can stop the Persians getting to Athens. So that's, and they're, and as long as the Persians don't, then they're happy with that. They don't need to fight right at that, at that particular moment, if you like. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so go ahead, Chris. No, no, go ahead, Rick. No, I was just going to say. So they 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 are there, um, and apparently the the uh, the Persians, everybody sort of sits in position. We're going to let the other guy attack. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then um, the Persians decide that uh, well, we've had enough. We're going to wipe these guys out, and and or they're actually going to get back on their boats. Some of them and try to sail down to Athens. They're going to try to do something else, and that's the moment the Athenians attack. Yeah, it's a very likely scenario. I think is that the there's a in the sources there's there's much is made of the fact that the persian cavalry were not there at the battle they're never mentioned in the uh, uh, in the fighting so the the greeks the mountain that we looked at is mount agrialiki it's the one bottom left on that map so the greeks are sitting there um before they they attack and somehow there comes an opportunity to you know they, they keep deploying and facing each other but this time the greeks kind of go all in and all at once and they, they do it at a moment where that appears to be the one where the Persian cavalry is not on the scene. So they negate that threat. And from that moment, they've, they've simply got to get to hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Persians as fast as they possibly can. And so, so tell us, Steve, a little bit more about, um, about these armies. I mean, I, mm. I know that's a vast topic, but how, how are they structured? Are they, are they, basically similar forces do they fight differently or uh... yeah they, they fight they fight very differently chris they, they um the, the the persians their sort of modus operandi really is is that they they only want to go into hand-to-hand -hand combat when the enemy is is in a disordered state and is not really fit to fight in that sense so they're going to use archers and cavalry cavalry not to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat but to ride up throw javelins to fire bows and, and just bombard the enemy with missiles from a mobile force and their their archer forces and we, who come from a variety of different nations and ethnic groups within the persian empire there are for their are indian arrows that have been found on the battlefield at marathon for instance um but they they are just simply going to want to shower the greeks with volley after volley after volley of arrows until their forces disintegrate and then they will charge themselves what the greeks are fighting is they're fighting in a hoplite phalanx of um, heavily armed soldiers with helmets breastplates greaves big round shields and and and, uh, and thrusting spears and they will for the most part fight eight ranks deep they have to thin themselves out in the middle of Marathon to make their line long enough to um, match the Persian forces, which plays to their advantage. So that they, so they need to get to combat in the best order they possibly can as quickly as possible. And they have to cover roughly a mile. And the last kind of 200 yards of that is going to be under Persian arrow fire. And they do it so quickly that they, they manage to engage with essentially minimal casualties and what happens in the battle fundamentally is that the the weakened greek center gives way but the the wings of the of the army prevail and they simply envelop the persians in a kind of in a killing field in the end and then pursue the stragglers to the ships it's funny because you know 1500 years or 2000 2000 years later at the Battle of Agincourt, you know, Henry V 
and the British forces win because of their archers. Absolutely, yeah. Right, the archers yeah. and and the French are want to come to hand to hand combat, and the archers, you know, basically take them out before they mm. can. Yeah. Uh, and, and here it's the opposite. I, I find myself kind of confused by 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 this battle, and and the, I mean the same question may come up with the Battle of Salamis. The Greeks mm. are presumably outnumbered. The 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 Persians. Uh, seem to have uh, with the with the bows and arrows better technology. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> why did the Greeks win? <laughs> Good, I, I think so. I mean, a I think the the Persian bow is not the English longbow. I think that's something. It doesn't doesn't have the same power and range. I think. Um, uh, but the I think it's partly. The, I think the Persians are taken by surprise here. It's. The, the, the Herodotus, describe, Herodotus describes it is that the Persians think that what the Greeks do is, in their words, lethal insanity. They're not expecting this to happen for the Greeks to attack without cavalry support, without light, light armed infantry support. I mean, the, there may have been some of that there, but it's not mentioned in the, in the fighting. And so they uh, and, and as I say, it's the, this, I think it's the speed of the of the Greek onslaught and the unexpectedness of it that that is what wins the day for them, I think, is that the, and, and if they can get to hand-to-hand -hand combat, then again, it's a description that Herodotus makes, it's kind of exaggerated, but it's, it's like, it's, it's like fully armed men fighting naked men. That's how he describes it. Mm. It's so, so if, if, if they can, the, the Greeks have a special name for it when they're, mm. when their phalanx engages, when this eight man deep formation, which is when it's, powering forward in, in good order, it's terrifying, actually. Um, when they finally engage, it, it, it becomes a, lot, a bit like the line of scrimmage in a, an American football game or a hyper-violent rugby scrum. It's um, that everybody pushes as well, and they have a special word for it. It says othismos, which is the, the pushing, the shoving. So they just lean in and push and shove, and, and, and once they get the upper hand, then once the battle is turned, that's that's really the end of it for the for the defeated side. It, when when it when it when the battle turns, everything then happens very very quickly. And, and then the, there's there. Sorry, ah. I'm so excited. I'm I'm interrupting. <laughs> um, but there's one other uh, part of this battle that that's important to mention, which is that 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 we've talked about Athens quite a bit, but that other Greek city state among the hundreds, but the one that's most mm. military, most you know gung ho fighters. They um, they're a little busy. They they this is not a good time for them. So they're not Sparta is not at this battle. They Sparta somehow Sparta. managed to avoid it. Yeah, Sparta's not Sparta isn't there, and, and Sparta you know is acknowledged as being the finest exponents of this kind of warfare on the Greek side within the Greek world. But and the Athenians seek help. They send someone to run all the way to Sparta and and run all the way back with the reply. And um, and the Spartans say, well, yeah, actually, yeah, guys, we'd, we'd, we'd like to help and we're very happy to help. But we're actually having a religious festival at the moment. And a little busy. Uh, <laughs> Apollo, basically, Apollo is more important than you. Uh, once once the full moon is gone and the festival is over, then we're on our way. And when the battle is fought, the full moon has gone and the Spartans are on their way, <laughs> which may have influenced the Persian aspects of this or, or may not. But uh, the Spartans, uh, you know, eventually show up, but they they arrive late. <laughs> so, yeah. so, but the, so what are some of the some of, what are some of the fallout from this this battle? Because it seems pretty conclusive. Yet we have two more battles to go. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. So how, how does, that, how does this think, fall work? Good, good question. I think the I think the Persian Empire. First of all, the fallout for for Athens is it becomes incredibly self-confident and, uh, and 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 its status becomes greatly elevated within the within the Greek world I think so they they um, and they feel that that they've if you like saved their democracy at this particular point um, the Persians I mean they're not going to take this defeat lying down they're coming back there's um, they, they've got they had two war aims at this point I think um, uh, possibly a third, which may have been the conquest of Greece, but they wanted to punish the state of Eretria, which was on the 
island of Eubea, just across from where Marathon is, for being involved in a rebellion against Persia that was uh, um, that, that, that happened a few years before. And they wanted to punish Athens for also being involved in that uh, um, in that in that rebellion, in which forces from Athens and Eretria had burned the Persian region capital of, uh, of uh, Sardis, and and incinerated by accident, but they had incinerated a major temple. So the initial war aims of the Persians was to conquer Eretria, which they did. And they took hostages back and slaves back from Eretria to the middle of what's now Iran and to conquer Athens. So their mission was 50 percent concluded. So 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 we have un, basically the Persians have unfinished business. And and what happens is so and, and King Darius is, is is definitely up for coming back and starts to prepare for it. But then he dies. And then his son Xerxes takes over, and there's, and, and he needs to deal with a, a whole load of problems before he can sort of put this um, punishing Athens thing back on his agenda, if you like. D does that kind of explain the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so um, I'm going to throw this this uh, um, this up again here. So <clears throat> the, the the second battle. Yeah, uh, that you talk about is the Battle of Thermopylae. I don't yeah. know if I'm saying any of these things correctly. No, that's that's good. Um, and, uh, and and so it's ten years after yeah. the, the first battle, and yeah. and this time Xerxes, the son of, yeah. say it's not yeah. Darius, it's yeah Darius. Xerxes. Yeah. No, Dar no, the father's name is D Darius. Did you Darius, or Darius, Darius, okay. Darius, whichever you okay. like. Yeah. So <laughs> so well, I'm just trying to you know pronounced correctly. <laughs> yeah. So um, so instead of coming across in a fleet, they march. Yeah. And they do this epic march around the uh, Aegean Sea. They uh, and they come down um, and eventually uh, get to, uh, they they manage uh, uh, at, at one point, uh, well, we'll get to that. But they get down to this, this uh, place, Thermopylae. Uh, and this is where, very, very famously, been told in movies and books mm -hmm. and such, 300 Spartans, along with perhaps a few thousand other people who did not have the same PR agency, so they didn't get into the press release, yes. um, hold off a huge Persian army before ultimately going down fighting. Now, this is, battle has been celebrated for 2,500 years, but it is a defeat. So yeah. what is it that makes it worth um, all the ink that it's gotten? <laughs> I think it's, in, in essence, a... a uh, it's a story of heroism and sacrifice, I think, uh, in many ways, and it's it's a crucial element in the in the whole scenario of the wars because I think fundamentally it it buys time, and time is one of the most important things in this conflict. I think there's a number of things that that are crucial. There's there's the there's the fighting forces on both sides and their leaderships. There's their equipment. But we're also talking a war of logistics in a way. And the we're, we're told again and again and again about, particularly when Xerxes comes, about the enormous size of the forces that he, he brings with him and, the, and he deploys. It's, it's in the millions. Um, yeah, here is a, a, a fine Persian warrior uh, who's uh, um, he, he's in the British Museum these days, and these uh, but they they have these uh, yeah sort of these elite Persian troops with with spears and bows and uh, uh, beautifully decorated uh, uh, Persian warriors. So he, he has this vast um, army, and the things that the Greeks can use to to oppose him are you know, themselves and their equipment and their hoplite way of fighting, their unity if they can generate that, but also I think their landscape and the weather as well, and the weather at, on land and at sea, and they 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 know the locality. So they and with the force that the Persians have, there is they famously are drinking rivers dry when they so many of them they just drink rivers dry. But if you can stop, if, if that force loses impetus and you can stop it, then 
you can only drink that river dry once kind of thing and and you still have to feed all those people and uh, and look after them and, and and what have you so that the longer that the greeks can fend the persians off the more likely their chances of winning the overall war uh, are and uh, very much what that's what they are seeking to do at thermopylae i think that they they're, they're trying to hold this up and it becomes i think such a famous battle because it's so brilliantly described by Herodotus and, and other ancient accounts and it's brilliantly memorialized by some great Greek poets the likes of Simonides uh, in very memorable lines but uh, it, it, it yes they say it becomes this this archetypal tale of the resistance of a few in the face of overwhelming odds from many 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 that uh, that ultimately despite being a defeat that that self sacrifice ultimately wins a war i think that's what it's really about in its the way it's received now but steve just to burst a few bubbles and you know maybe give everybody their due could you mention some of the other uh, greeks that we should know about that were at the mausoleum <laughs> yeah there's uh, there are there are plataeans and and thebans and uh, um and phocians uh, there's a there's a uh, there are people from the Peloponnese and there's people from mainland Greece. So there are uh, and probably several thousand of these people. The 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 accounts you know will maybe number the Greek defenders in the first place in maybe seven thousand defenders. So uh, although as I say it's the it's the it's the three hundred Spartans who get the uh, who get the PR in the end, and not only that actually, but this. What they're trying to do is, is to, as I say, is to use the geography of Greece in order to, 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 their, to their benefit. And really, the, the way that Xerxes' forces are coming into Greece from the north, they have to go through a very, very narrow pass between the sea and some, some steep and, uh, and, and high mountains on one side. And the Greeks are quite simply trying to block this passageway and uh, with their with their land forces and just to keep them at bay for as long as they can mm -hmm. at the same time they've also tried to do and as he, yeah this is the, so the the pass itself runs uh, east west it look, looks like the road that's on the map there and uh, there are mountains to the south and sea to the north and uh, the where the Phocian wall is marked and these these gates the west gate the middle gate the east gate these are very narrow passages that are only really wide enough for a you know for a cart track between uh, between the sea and and the land so the Greeks are trying to block that and they're going to take up their position at the middle gate pretty much uh, by the Phocian wall that's where they're going to try and do their fighting with a, a, a camp off at near where Alpeni is with the Persians camped at the uh, uh, at the western end there. Um, so, um, I mean, we don't want to give everything away, but the, the <laughs> 300 Spartans and other people, they don't survive this battle. Mm. The the Persians win, uh, and, and people can read that the, the Spartans very famously um, uh, are asked to uh, to uh, you know surrender and give up their weapons and say, "Come and take them," yeah. uh, in their laconic Spartan style. Yeah. Um, uh, Athens gets sacked after after this, right? That's after this. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And 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 burned badly damaged, but yeah. the Athenians have a runoff, and they I mean not runoff, but they have they have. Um, they have um, reformed, and that the third battle that you talk about is the Battle of Salamis. And the mm -hmm. interesting thing about this is that Athens is not really a naval power up to this point, mm -hmm. but as it in the years before this, in that ten-year interwar period, yeah. as it sees Persia preparing to return for another tilt, it decides to become one. Yeah, and they've they've got they've been doing some silver mining, they've got some money. Uh, and in a few years, they build like 100 or 200 ships, uh, uh, triremes, that are eventually able to provide the backbone of the Greek naval force that wins at the Battle of Salamis. Yeah. And I got to tell you, Steve, when I read the book, it seems like some sort of miracle. It's like <laughs> they were lucky enough to think about, yeah. well, let's just spend all our money instead of giving it to each other. Let's just build all these ships. And yeah. they built the ships and then they managed to defeat the 
the the um, Persians yeah. at at Salamis. It it it, it seems almost like. I, you know, I, I started to sympathize with the people who said Herodotus must be making stuff up because it seemed <laughs> yeah. like it was almost made up. Yeah, it is. It's an astonishing thing. I mean, the, 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 the as, uh, certainly as the as the historical sources present this to us, anyway, is that yeah, they in in the interwar period after after Marathon before before the next invasion, they they find a particularly rich vein of silver in their state-owned mining district and. In normal circumstances, they really would. They'd just divvy it up and everybody would get a nice bonus and everyone gets a bit of cash. But they have a leader, Themistocles, who is, his vision really is to create Athens as a naval state and as a trading state in a way that it hasn't. And he, he manages to persuade the Athenian assembly that it would be a good idea not to give out this money and everybody take a pocket full of cash, but to build you know, a huge fleet, fleet of state-of-the-art warships. And actually, the way he spins it is, this is not to fight Persia. This is to fight Aegina, which is a Greek island that you can see from Athens. And boy, do we hate those guys. We'd really like a fleet to fight those guys. So so that, that's kind of, I guess that's how he gets the idea through. And, uh, and the Athenians do. They go ahead and they build this fleet and they learn how to use it as well. It's, it is astonishing. So, Steve, I, I'm going to bring up some questions here, Rick. So, if I yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, um, Frank Cook has asked: uh, Is it possible to identify a common factor in the approach of the Greek military leaders that ultimately led to victory, led to the victory that saved democracy? That's a nice question, Frank. I, I think it's um, th th there is, in a sense. I mean, and yet there isn't, in a sense. The thing that they have to achieve, uh, the, a common factor in the approach, that's the hardest thing that they're trying to achieve when Themistocles is trying to get the Athenians to fight at Salamis he has he constantly has to battle amongst his own people to make them do that because different people want to fight in different places for different reasons so um, so gaining unity of of approach is really really difficult and the guy who was able to do that in the Xerxes invasion above all the others I think is is Themistocles, and I think the the other thing I think that come one of the things in the narrative that always strikes me is is that the Persians, particularly Xerxes, are always being given good advice and they never take it. So they <laughs> and, and and whenever someone gives the Persians a good advice and they don't take it, things go horribly wrong. You wonder how their um, empire got so big. But, but isn't, it, isn't, it, <laughs> isn't this a, a a little bit of the 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 Greek bias in the history uh, telling of this? Good, well, oh, they were didn't take the advice again. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, there's, there's a lovely bit where um, actually there's a the Xerxes is accompanied by a Spartan king in exile, Demaratus. And, uh, and Xerxes keeps asking him, he says, you know, who are these people? Do they always fight like this? And, you know, what are they doing now? And, and he says, you know, they, well, they might be chaotic and disunified, but there's a, something they always obey, and that's the law. And I'm going to tell you that whatever you think, however many of you, however badly outnumbered, they will fight. It's freedom or death for them. Uh, that's, and I, I really like the way that he talks about that. And there's, uh, there's another Persian who asks some Greeks, you know, what, what are the Greeks doing at the moment? You know, and, and he says, oh, they're, they're celebrating the Olympic Games. And, and, and he says, and what's the prize? And he says, well, it's just a wreath of wild olive. And it, it's just like, whoa, you know, these people are serious. You know, they, they compete for that, <laughs> you know, and not for, you know, this is, these people are so unlike us that we don't get them. So I think, Kind of, I've gone off from Frank's question now, but, but I, I think there's, you know, the, these misunderstandings on the Persian side, as we're presented with them, uh, seem to be quite part of the uh, the process. I think. So, a question from another viewer, Doug McCord uh, says, uh, "What was the lifespan of an ancient Greek? It is t ten years between the battles. Would it be a new army entirely?" And I guess, I guess the the flip side of that is, you know, or do we know of people who were who were there uh, both times? good question yeah it's i mean life expectancy life expectancy is a difficult one but if you you know, live to your mid 40s you've probably done all right you become officially an old man uh geron in most greek societies at the age of 60 you live that far you know so that's, and that's venerable 
um, and old. But but yeah, there are. So um, we are, Chris. We are. I mean, I am venerable. You're venerable. I'm, I'm approaching. You're not quite venerable. there yet. No, no. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, so sorry. I'm venerable as well. It's, it, you, you, actually, the, the, the Greek word for it is geron. It gives us our word geriatric. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's just not quite as nice as venerable, though. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but uh, yeah, the the I think the the so there would be people who fought in both without question, and um, perhaps Aeschylus, the uh, the great tragic playwright, who we if he fought at Marathon, and uh, he um, uh, and 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 it says so. He wrote his own epitaph, and that was the thing he was most proud of—not his plays, but the fact that he fought at Marathon. And he uh, and he also uh, wrote a play called *The Persians*, which is a, a dramatization of the Battle of Marathon. So there's uh, it, hard to tell. We don't know for sure whether he fought in the latter battle, but he he, he was certainly alive at the time of both battles, and and uh, many other Athenian fighters would have been as well. So, Steve, um, given you know obviously the impact of these battles on. Um... Western history, I guess you would say. How is this battle viewed in uh, in the East? How in well, how is it viewed in Iran. Persia? How, how yeah. is it viewed now in Iran? Uh, yeah, Iraq? It, it's it's in many ways it's viewed as a footnote. You know, right. it's um, you know, it's the 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 Achaemenid Persian Empire is a vast and mighty and long lived thing. You know, I mean, it, it, the these defeats in Greece don't bring an end to the Persian Empire, for instance. You know, they, they, Xerxes continues ruling and, and, uh, and the Achaemenids will rule until Alexander the Great finally rolls them over in the end. So, you know, it doesn't bring down the Persian Empire. So it's, it's, it's often seen, I think, as a, you know, a sort of, sort of like a bit of a fringe footnote on the, uh, uh, on the, on the, on the edge of the Persian Empire, I think. And, and I think that, you know, it, this interests me, I think, because, you know, Xerxes and Darius could have spun this as a victory, you know, because, you know, what did Darius, his forces destroyed Eretria, Xerxes burnt Athens. That was mission accomplished, essentially. Could have left at that point had he, he wished to. So, but he didn't. And, and he could have put up inscriptions like there are in various places in the Persian Empire, trumpeting his, his victories, you know, I... Xerxes, king of kings, lord of many lands, lord of the earth far and wide, burnt Athens in revenge for the atrocities committed against my father. You know, we, we could have had that kind of information, but we don't. And I think that's interesting. So, you know, wh whether they, they're not seeking to draw attention to that or whether it is indeed seen as a, you know, a minor skirmish on the fringe is, uh, I mean, it's hard to tell, but... Uh, but always worth thinking about, I think. Robert Graves' fantastic poem, The Persian Version, <laughs> is a is a wonderful thing to track out. It's there's a it's transcribed in the book, uh, where he, he sees it from a, a sort of Persian propaganda viewpoint, you know, and it was right. uh, oh just a little, little skirmish, you know, it went went fairly well and that was that. <laughs> so um, you know, as as we approach the end of our of our hour, you know, what are the what is the lessons that we should take from this? I mean, do we, if we are, if we are voting uh, in elections today, and let's not get into elections today, but if we're voting in elections today, are we, are we, are we thanking uh, uh, Themistocles and the other uh, uh, Hellenic peoples who fought against the Persians? Um, are there other lessons that you draw from this? You have visited all of these areas. You have walked the battlefields at. Uh, Thermopylae and Marathon, and um, you know, you've spent a lot of time thinking about this. So, you know, what what lessons do you draw from it? That's really interesting. I think I think we do owe the Greeks a lot in our democratic system. You know, to as uh, you know, they they invented it, and at this early stage in its development, they 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 fought for it and they maintained it, and each time they won, they cemented it even more securely in many ways so yeah we owe i think a lot of our political system to that and I, I think i think one of the overarching themes that comes through the the whole tale of the 
of the Persian invasion is, and is, and it's something that Xerxes doesn't get, I think, and the, and I think that the Greeks do, and is that the, that to invade a free people who were prepared to fight for that freedom and and everything that it brings on their own territory is actually a very dangerous foolhardy thing to do i think there's the, there's there's much of that it's a, you know, the, the the perils of invading free people who have deep rooted things to fight for is uh, uh, is one of the things that comes out of the narrative you know the athenians thought that they were autochthonous that they were actually literally born originally from the land that they inhabited they'd always lived there and their earliest people were actually born from that land they'd never been anywhere else so that 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 feeling that they that this is our land since eternity is is deeply embedded and we are and we have these principles of freedom of under the law freedom of speech and uh, e e equality under law equality of speech and equality of power that make up democracy that is something that they were not prepared to relinquish i think even against massively overwhelming odds so steve yeah was, that was a, a rousing endorsement of classics departments everywhere and why yeah. <laughs> I, I I took I took classes from uh, the classics department at Dartmouth. It was one of my classics professors who, uh, based on my experience in his class, said he thought that that graduation would see me uh, trying to finish up my last paper, you know, moments before the graduation, and hand it in late and get the grade done very late, and <laughs> just pass the note to the president that yes, he's graduated, and give him his diploma. But uh, uh, listen, uh, Steve Kershaw, thank you so much for joining us much. today. Fantastic. And just want to remind people that your book is right here. And it is, I can't read it because it's mirror image, but it's three epic battles that, that saved, saved democracy. democracy. See, democracy. <laughs> and uh, we appreciate your taking part in History Happy Hour and talking to us about it today. Thank you so, so much. Absolutely. And we didn't even get into the sex because there's sex in the book too. So, yeah, oh, there's so much you know, the sex and the violence. But that was my it, next it, question was about sex, and we just didn't even get there. So you just <laughs> now you have to buy the book to find out about the sex. Sex, the violence, <laughs> politics, it's all there. It's so, all happening. Absolutely. Steve, thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Big pleasure. Big pleasure. Thank you. I am really excited uh, yeah. as we end 2023 that we have a bunch of great new shows coming up Absolutely. in 2024. Yeah. And the first one of those is going to be a book I'm really looking forward to and hopefully by now have read most of. <sighs> but I'm predicting because yeah. this is an encore episode. But the next week we're going to talk to uh, Brooke Barbier. Oh, you the, know how this turns out. Who's yeah. the author of King Hancock. King Hancock. I a moderate same. founding father. Okay. A, a moderate revolutionary. Mm. And uh, uh, we're going to we're gonna talk to him. I, I have to say, when uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was on the uh, Boston Tea Party trip, a lot of those people mm -hmm. have signed on to our list to come to Lexington with us in 2025. Yeah. And your sound has just completely gone out. I can hear you now. Yeah, okay. So people have signed up for 2025. Yeah, we get a lot of people signed up to go to Lexington in 2025. They all want to be on your. They all want to be on your group. So. Well, we'll just uh, you know we'll just they'll have to we'll introduce them to the unique viewpoint of Chris Anderson. The truth. The truth. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, saying goodbye to 2023. <laughs> we'll see you in 2024. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Shout at us on Twitter. Listen to our podcast. Bye -bye. Back us on Patreon and browse historyhappyhour.com. Thanks, everybody. Happy Hogmanay and be safe.